England are in dreamland after the first day at Headingley. After being put in, they bowled India all out for 78 and finished the first day on 120 for nothing. As close as to the perfect day as you can get. We've got lots of listeners' questions to get through. We've got two from Ram. The first one, Ben, is <laughs> when are we going to see you sport long hair again? Yeah, well, watching Burns and Hamid bat and obviously two luscious locked opening batsmen doing their thing may- did make me think that maybe I needed just a bit more of that uh, if only in homage, if not because it would make me be as good at them as cricket, which it definitely wouldn't. Uh, but it's also, I mean, you can see on the video, it's not, it's at the stage now where I kind of need to either get it cut or let it grow long. So I guess we'll find out in a few months. The more relevant question was, as an Indian fan, what do you think the core reason for the unpredictability of this Indian team is? Uh, the core reason, probably the fallibility of that three, four, five. I think. I mean, this series, they've obviously outplayed England up to this point, well, up to today. But uh, that's been based on a very strong opening partnership to players who are in good form in Rohit Sharma and Kara Hall, which both makes it easier for the players to follow and uh, has also just masked their concerns. I and mean, you saw in, on day one of the last test when India uh, batted brilliantly and then collapsed the next day because of the struggles of those three, four and five. Ignore is going to have a chance when you have basically those three not performing and then also eight to 11, apart from their like good show in the last game, also not being good. Like mm. it's quite a lot of, players who aren't getting very many runs basically uh, and I think you get it just in general in test cricket at the moment when it's so bowling dominated that like even the best teams get bowled out cheaply not that uh, like pretty commonly as well I guess and India are a bowling dominated team with a fallible batting on it basically and I guess that it's almost underappreciated how important the specific ball that's used is in England the mm-hmm. Duke's balls um, that they, they are slightly different to, to each other you know, that's why Anderson takes so long um, deciding which ball to pick every morning. Um, and Craig Overton at the end of the day said that him and Ollie Robinson um, help select the ball at the end of the day. They, they do just swing differently. Um, and conditions first up were conducive to swing bowling. Um, it moved around quite a lot. It was humid, overcast. Joe Root didn't look that upset when he lost the toss. He had, had a quite a wide grin, actually. Um, going back to the start of the day, it was Anderson who set the tone. Things of three for six from eight overs with the new ball. I don't think the highlights do him justice. His control, his control was impeccable. Um, and he set all of Rahul, Pajara and Kohli up, bowling uh, a number of in-swingers before getting on to hoop away. Um, and I thought Craig Overton was really good as well today. Um, no let-up at all, just hammers a consistent line of length. And then from that release point with that control, that's always going to cause problems. And he averages something like 12 in first-class cricket over the last couple of years so I'm not surprised he's done um, well in England and I think he's just quite unlucky that this is only his second home test Yeah I think something that well a lot of stats sort of can tell the story of the day but Ishant Sharma I think conceded more runs in his first over than Anderson did in the entire Indian first innings which I think goes a long way because I mean, India didn't bowl well either after obviously struggling I thought Bumra was good Yeah but I, th- I think there was basically there were always just loose balls around the corner which is uh, England's opening pair kind of thrive off that they're not a pair that's going to I mean what actually one thing they did do really well was sort of tip and run Mm. uh, which did transfer some pressure back but for the most part they're not going to be going looking for boundaries they're very happy to wait for them to come and they did come basically there were a lot of short and wide balls which Hamid especially put away really nicely but he's only going to be putting those away when they're there to be put away I think we should just maybe dwell on the conditions a little bit because there were a few there was a bit of discussion about obviously the conditions in India at the mm. start of this year uh, and whether England had been bowled out for 78 a lot of England fans would wake up see that scorecard and think it was an absolute dust bowl these were really tough conditions to bat in but I don't think it was the pitch exactly I think at Headingley it tends to be the swing rather than the seam that does it uh, I think there was a little bit of assistance from the pitch but not a huge amount I think actually it was the the swing that was doing it. there was that cloud cover early on and I mean, also, because you do see it headingly, like uh, when those clouds go away, it does get a lot easier to bat. So in a way, Kyle's decision to bat first, I mean, he doesn't win a lot of tosses. So he wasn't really used to having to make a decision. But had they got through even like four down to T, uh, and you'd say it was about even that point you saw in that last session, now they could have really like sort of got away and, and then compiled something. But that just didn't happen. England bowled too well, basically. Yeah, one final thing I'd say on India is if you're 78 all out, however well the opposition bowl and whatever the conditions are, you've probably still done a few things wrong um and i thought that there were more balls they could have left on length basically um almost all of england's wickets were were caught and um there were some graphics on on the sky commentary today that showed that um 
to take your wickets at Headingley compared to other English grounds, you need to pitch it up more, partly to do with the bounce. And at the very, very start of the India innings, it was actually something that Ollie Robinson wasn't quite getting right. He was bowling like a, what looked like quite a good full length. But when it hit the bats from the pads, Hawkeye showed the ball was going quite a lot over. And then when you saw Hamid and Burns bat towards the end of the day, Hamid in particular left a couple of balls that looked really close, but actually weren't. On, he just left them on length. And I think that was something that India probably could have done a little bit more than they did. Yeah, and if we're talking about fallibility in that uh, England in India batting effort, we've got to talk about Rohit Sharma, really, who has mm. looked he's looked the most secure Indian batsman this whole tour, really. Probably just ahead of Kerr Rahul, I'd say, even though it's Rahul who's got the bigger scores. Uh, Rohit just looks like a kind of a class apart from, from everyone, apart from Joe Root, really. But his issue has been, and it, and it has been basically since, so even, even since he got promoted to open the batting, he's always looked really good away from home in Australia in the World Test Championship final now here. And he has always basically found a way to give it away. He still doesn't have that 100 away from home. And this was one of his worst of the lot, really, just in terms of the optics of it, in terms of him having battled so hard, India really struggling. He hadn't really, at that point, earned the right to try and dominate, to pull a ball that was that far outside off stump and then just spoon it up to, to, to mid on. I mean, that was an... I mean, you'd, you'd say it's an aberration, except it's becoming a, a bit of a habit for him. He clearly has the technique for... Uh, batting in, in in overseas conditions and he just can't show he has the temperament for it at this point mm. um paul hudson asks how is it possible to go from looking like a poor village side on day five at lord to this performance it's maddening but i guess this is why we love english cricket yeah and we we were trying to think of i mean it's it's, it's a hard thing to think of anyway but of uh, of two consecutive days in a test series that have been so dominated by uh, the opposite teams and also just of days of test cricket for england which have been kind of more complete than this. I mean, the last time they uh, took a first innings lead without losing a wicket was uh, the Boxing Day Test in 2010, so over a decade ago. And obviously that came after a, a pretty hefty loss as well. So that was a that's a similar contrast there. I guess there, there were also Trent Bridge uh, 2015 vibes when Stuart Broad took eight for 15. And then the thing, the, I guess the difference there is that England had basically won the game by stumps on that day because they bowled uh, Australia out so quickly, whereas they haven't bowled India out ended to like 40 overs we bowled out so there is still if you're watching this and you're thinking like what 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 could happen for India now there is still a small chance and actually if you're watching them bat maybe not that smaller chance maybe a reasonably decent chance that once you get past opening partnership if you get root early you all of a sudden get them out for somewhere around 220 and then it's kind of game on again that could still happen but I think mm. who we have to give credit to overall really and also and this is you know uh, one of the days of test cricket this summer he's actually the least is Joe Root I think as a captain I think he gets a lot of stick and rightly for decisions he makes on the field I mean he captained very poorly and he admitted that on the uh, on the final day uh, at Lords um, but what he is good at is rallying his team uh, when they do get beaten which does happen quite a lot but he is good at rallying them lots of practice yeah and and, and and rousing them to sort of go again they clearly all do play for him and it's not I mean it sounds like damning with faint praise in a way it is but also it is like lots of England teams when things start to go wrong things go really wrong really quickly and that mm-hmm. doesn't happen under Joe Root they have a they are very they bounce back a lot uh, he is good at sort of almost seeing the wider picture at sort of uh, and, and at getting them to go again and that's what happened today basically and uh and it's, I don't think it'll be the last time that, uh, that, that that skill will be needed looking at their schedule over the next few months. Mm, we had a couple of questions about whether or not this was England's best ever day. Um, Zach Jopling said, given the injuries, the momentum into the Test match, the series in India, the prospect of a defeat at home before the Ashes, Burns out of form, Hamid under pressure, new man in at three, loads of bowlers injured, um, and then basically the perfect day on the scorecard. I think, it, I think it's got to be up there given all the context behind it. Um, moving on to... My moment of the day by an absolute mile was Hamid reaching 50. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it was amazing to see him back in that way, not just get that 50, but I thought it looked really assured. He didn't really give an opportunity away until he, he was on 46 with a shot that took him to 50, Nick through the slips. Um, he just defends very confidently. He's very compact. I like how he gets forward. Um, I liked India did give him a few freebies, but he properly punished them um, in a way that Dom Sibley wasn't really doing. Um, Freddie Light asks, is there a bit of Labashane in Hamid? Something a little unorthodox, but in a good way, or is it just the way he finishes a leave or forward defences sometimes? I think there's a bit in that, in that when Labashane defends, um, there's positivity in that 
shot. Like he makes a conscious decision that I am going to do this rather than okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna attack. So okay, I defend. Whereas there's like a conscious positivity to every shot that Hami plays. Yeah, and and actually, Lab, then how Labuschain leaves as well. I mean, obviously, a lot of people dislike the way he leaves and they think it's too flamboyant. And he has said that it's like it is deliberately show it is a way to sort of get himself into a contest and into an innings uh, rather than it being like a passive thing. It is a a positive thing. And yeah, and yeah, you can see there is almost like it's kind of a concentration mixed with fun with the way that Hamid defends sometimes and that he'll like sort of defend it like with obviously those really low hands angling the ball right down into the pitch and then he'll sort of like trace the path of the ball with his eyes as it bounces back up and sort of rolls slightly down the pitch and he'll sort of do a, a few little steps on his tiptoes. It almost uh, like sometimes he almost seems like a fencer, I think, in the way he's sort of like a... Uh, like sort of dance the way he kind of dances forward a little bit and yeah. kind of rocks back at the last moment yeah I can I can see that can yeah see so that. yeah I mean I, he obviously he did bat he did bat very well uh there was also an inside edge very early on yes, which that's true. was that's slightly true. hairy uh I guess if if you're looking for reasons to not feel too positive which I don't know why you would be but I guess if if this is a ground where you have to pitch it very full to get your rewards and Hamid is a player who likes to almost set himself very forward then actually he can negate that almost better than most players and on a ground where pitching it slightly further back that's where him being almost so forward can be worse in a way because Mm. you you can't like you can't smother it and those balls are more dangerous inherently than they are at Headingley Mm. I guess Uh, but he was brilliant and Burns was brilliant too I mean he's uh, Mm. obviously been kind of England's second best batsman the summer after Root and has also still struggled in general when he gets Uh, past naught he averages over 50 this year mm. so um, yeah, he has looked in good nick. I thought he looked really good. Um, but I think that's all we've got time for today. If you enjoy the show, let us know in the comments. And if you've got any questions for tomorrow's show, let us know in the comments as well. And we'll be back after day two. Goodbye. <laughs>